ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידשנו במצוותיו וציוונו לעסוק בדברי תורה. I want you to take a few minutes to focus on this blessing that we just said. We said blessed are you Lord our God king and creator of the universe who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us and to is to do what and gross it's the hebrew word lasso which means that when we are studying god's word we need to be engrossed that means when we come to service or when we come to the house of god now remember those of you have been studying with me you would know that the synagogue this is not a church now if you think this is a church this is not the place for you this is a synagogue a synagogue is what a synagogue is an extension of the temple beit hamikdash which used to be in jerusalem Okay the earthly Beit HaMikdash or the earthly temple in Jerusalem was it was aligned properly to the heavenly temple or also known as the garden of eden according to genesis chapter 1 so there is all a spiritual significance to it so if there was a temple and if you happen to be in jerusalem you had to go to the temple and if you go to the temple you cannot just go to the temple like you're coming over here or you're going to the fish market in the fish market you could do however you want go however you want live however you want it doesn't matter but when you come to the temple of god there are certain prerequisites during those days the, not everybody was allowed to come because people from the nations would not know the proper etiquette of what it means to be in the house of god now those of us in the messiah we claim to be engrafted to the jewish people that means you need to know the proper etiquette of the house of israel not the proper etiquette of what you live your life is it doesn't matter how you live your life if you think that you have been engrafted through the messiah into the household of israel and you have now become co-heirs along with messiah and you become inheritance of and the and the and the promises of abraham is yours that means there is an etiquette in the house of god what is the etiquette i can't do what i want how i want like i want in the kingdom of god that's what when you're in the temple if you 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 in the temple you can't have your mobiles ringing it's very dishonoring to god maybe maybe in the fish market you can this is not a fish market maybe in the church you can this is not a church this is the synagogue it is a replica or extension of the temple it is a place where the presence of god was there Remember a couple of weeks ago we were learning about the story of Aaron's two sons Nadab and Avihu they took the things of God casually and what does the scripture say that the fire of the altar came into their nostrils and took the breath of life now just because it does not happen physically or you don't see it happening in your life don't think it is not happening Many of you have lost your connection with God. You have lost your relationship with God. You're just doing it and you think I'm all right, but according to the spirit of God and according to the scriptures, you're not all right. There's something absolutely wrong. It's time Shavuot Pentecost is a time of renewal. It is a time to return back. Return back to what? Return back to the Torah. Return back to the spirit of God. Return back to believing in God. Return back to loving God. In the words of 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 the writer of the book of Revelation he says, "Return back to your first love." He's been so engrossed in other activities. I'm engrossed in my work, engrossed in my in my job, in my home. No, friends, there are certain things that takes precedence. You need to do certain things in the right time, in the right way, because that's the way we basically bring honor to God. That's what I say. That when we come to the house of God, we need to know what are these appointed times. It is now many of us at one time of our life we used to celebrate Sunday. now because we believe in shabbat now we replace sunday as shabbat 
That means the same casualness that we have on Sunday, we have on Saturday. It is very, very dishonoring. Such activities do not bring honor to God. It basically brings displeasure to God. And that is why during the days of the temple, when people did things casually, without reverence and holiness, the Spirit of God, Hashem himself says, that I hate your festivals, I hate your offerings, I hate it. Why? Because there is no heart, there is no intention, something else is in your mind. You're consumed with something else. Neither do you want to get it right, neither do you want to get help. You're just focused and you're just coming for the sake of coming, but the heart or the Spirit of God is not there within you. Nobody can manufacture it. You can't get it in Ratnadeep. You need to have a desire. You need to ask yourself, do I want to walk with God? God's not going to force you. In fact, the sages say, uh, Hashem leads a man according to what he desires. You can say, oh, I am like this because of me. Whatever it is, do you desire to walk with Hashem? Do you desire to walk in the ways of God? Do you desire to bring up a godly inheritance? Do you desire to raise up the next generation in the ways of God? Do you desire to cause your people to remember you for your walk with God? That's the most important thing. Or are you going to walk with God like a show? You know, when you go for a job, you have so many things put on your resume. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. So because of that, they will, they will invite you or call you to for a job. But what do, they, what, do, what do we put on the gravestone? Have you seen in any gravestones? B-Tech, M-Tech, MBBS. What do we say? Loving father, loving husband. Because it's about relationship. This is what it is all about. It's about intimacy. It's about relationship. It's not about what you did. You can do so many things, but in the sight of God, it doesn't matter. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you should not study. Education is important. Um, people in the, old, in the olden days, they, they believe that they have a calling of God. They would stop studying and go serving God. I want to encourage all that. You study. In the midst of your education, learn to serve God. In the midst of your education, understand what the Torah is saying. Understand what the Word of God is saying. Desire to grow in the ways of God. Stop giving excuses. Stop being lackadaisical. Stop giving whatever reason. Those of you who are working, how many of you who are managers or whatever bosses in your company will, will basically allow somebody below you to, 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 to work in the company if they are lackadaisical. Many of your companies, if you don't dress well, don't come. Don't, if you don't check in on time, don't come. If you, many of your companies, you have to keep your phone in the locker before you walk in into the workplace. If that, if that is the code of ethics, for the secular world, why is there no code of ethics when it comes to us in our service to God? Why do we come as if we've just come from the bed to the room? Why do we behave as if we, are you coming to meet me? I'm not the one who brought your salvation. I'm not the one who's rescued you from the grave or from the pit or from sin. I'm just a messenger of God. That means you need to be ready to seek God. Am I ready to meet the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the, the Lord Hashem Himself? That means I'm very, I, that means I need to be concerned. How I dress, what is my attitude, what is my thoughts, where am I going, what am I doing, am I prepared to meet Him? We want to catch a flight, we are five hours early. We want to catch a train. We are two hours early, especially in, in traffic like this in Hyderabad. But when it comes to the house of God, why are we late? Why do we show such disrespect to the name of Hashem? And then we call ourselves believers. Have you ever seen a masjid? Have you seen a masjid? Have you heard the masjid? 
from 4.45 in the morning, they start. That means when the man begins to call and say it's a time of prayer, in five minutes, people run and enter to pray. Because they believe with all of their heart, I should not come late when it comes to the house of God. Five minutes. And, if you are, and many times they live around the community. Now you say, but I don't live around the synagogue. It doesn't matter. You know, in, my, in, 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 in many years ago, I, was, I used to go very regularly to Nepal. And in Nepal, we, the, the, some certain places don't have road systems. Not because of anything, because it's a mountainous area. You have to climb up the mountain. But every time I've seen the service, if it says that the service begins at 10 o'clock, from 8 o'clock onwards, people are there. And the people from the fathers who climb up the mountain two, three hours, they're there at 8 a.m. Not because of anything, they come expecting. They come desiring. They want to seek God. They want to. And, and, and over there you would see how people, by faith, they give. Some of them, they don't even have the money, but they say, by the end of the month, I believe that God is going to give me this resource, and I want to give it, I want to use it for the kingdom of God. How many of us have that passion? Many of us, we'd say, oh, I gave my tithes, my duty, my responsibility. Many of us even come to the synagogue like that. My duty is done. If you're coming like that, you have missed the point. In fact, Peter says in the New Testament that you and I, through Messiah, are, are a royal priesthood. Which means that if you're coming for the sake of coming, then you have missed the point. Your service to God will not be acceptable. You will not be acceptable. The offering that you give will not be acceptable. You think this is a joke, guys? We need to be serious. That's why these festivals are called Shalosh Regalim. They had to walk. We have vehicles, but still we come late. We have luxury, but still we come late. We, we, everything, we have 101 reasons. Friends, you can keep all your reasons and file it in a big file. When you leave this earth, I'll make sure to put it in your coffin box and show it to Hashem. And let's see his response. If, you're, if you want to serve God, you say that you are a believer, then at least live like a believer in Yeshua. Stop behaving like the world. Are you with me? Shavuot is a season to stop all the nonsense. Shavuot means we have exactly just a couple of more months before Rosh Hashanah. What, what month is this? What month is this? Siwan, but in, in, in the Roman world, what is it? The month of May. June, July, August. Exactly a quarter. September is Rosh Hashanah. Things are going to change once again. Are you ready? Are you prepared? From last Rosh Hashanah to this Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah this year is in the month of September. Are you ready to face the master of the universe? Is your spiritual life the same? We are always worried, oh, I'm, I'm because of something that is happening over here. I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about that. Friends, most of you sitting here are not children. Once you cross the age of 13, you begin accountable to the heavenly court. Once you cross the age of 20, you are, your, what all your actions do have equal consequences. So the question this morning on Shavuot is do you desire to be serving God? Do you want to be close to God? Do you want God? This is what, is this what you want to pass to the next generation? Now you might say, I'm not married, I don't have the next generation. It doesn't matter. There are young people, even if you're not married, people are watching you. What is the inheritance that you want to pass on? Inheritance is not about money. You know what happened recently over here? 
2,000 rupee note is going out before, by the time Rosh Hashanah begins. It's going out. So everything that we collected, either we get rid of it or exchange it. This is all science. God is showing us something. If that is happening on the physical, tomorrow how do you know that the bank that you bank will, will not crash? And the crows and the lakhs that you've invested for whoever is gone. What are you going to do then? If your anchor is not on Hashem, if your anchor is not on Messiah, then what's going to happen is basically you're going to commit suicide in Hussein Sagar Lake. Because you have no faith, you, your eyes are somewhere else. You need to understand why am I, what is my purpose on this earth? God has called me to rectify me. I have some part to play in the grand plan of creation. Stop giving excuses. Stop finding reasons. When we are in a company and our company doesn't want to keep us anymore, we find reasons to make sure that they keep us because we want the job. Do we find reasons to make sure that God will keep us as his covenant people? God is not going to let us go. That's what covenant is. We are letting God go because we don't want to walk with him. By our actions, by our deeds, by our behavior. Are you with me? Shavuot is the second of the three biblical foot festivals in Hebrew known as the Shalosh Regalim, which falls on the month of Sivan, on the sixth of the month of Sivan, and continuing on the seventh of the month of Sivan, like today, is a Shabbat. It says in Exodus 23, like I said previously, that three times a year that you had to come to the place appointed by God, which was in Jerusalem, and the three times was first was Pesach, second was Shavuot, and the third was Sukkot. And then it also goes on to say in the book of Deuteronomy that especially when you come on these festivals, that you should not come empty-handed. That means that if you're looking forward for the festival of Shavuot, or especially if you're looking for the festival on, of Shabbat every week, you have planned your monthly Earnings in a way that every time I come into the temple or the house of God or into the synagogue, I will not come empty handed. That is why the zadaka is there. In the church, the, the offering box comes to you, but over here, the offering box doesn't come to you. You go. That's why when the Torah comes around, the Torah does not come to you. You get up from your place and go to the Torah if you desire. That's why I've been trying to tell Sharon, when he walks around, don't go and stop for everybody and mother everybody with the Torah. No. Do you want to touch the Torah? Do you want to focus on God? Then you get up. Move out from your place. Move out from the barricade. Touch it. Say that I love you, Hashem. Don't stop because the cloud and the Torah does not stop for anybody. You need to get up and run. Say, Lord, I desire this. I want to pick it up. That's why we don't come empty-handed. There are three highlights for Shavuot. Number one, Shavuot is about Matan Torah. The word Matan basically means gift. Also known as the giving of the Torah. Which basically symbolizes of what happened in Exodus chapter 19 and 20, which we just read. That's why we had so much of reading to do, because that's what it is all about. The Hebrew word matan basically means gift. The Torah, God's word, is a gift of God. These are not rules, these are not regulations. But this is a gift from God. For what? So that I can live lives that bring God all the glory. For his name to be exalted. For his name to be lifted. So that my life will be honorable before God and man when I live like this. This is not legalism. These are, I, have, I have certain things on how I want to run my home. That means each of us who are running homes are legalists. No, I'm just doing it for the safety and protection of my family. God is saying, I'm just doing this for the safety and protection of my family. That's why Torah is matan. Not only that, Yeshua, he himself was a gift. He was a matan for us. 
The second focus on, on Shavuot is the Megillat Ruth. A powerful book that many of us may have never read ever. Now, some of you may have read it, but you have not understood the power of this book. Who was Ruth? Ruth, the, the book of Ruth is about the story of a woman called Ruth. Who was she? She was a Moabite. Who is a Moabite? God said in the Torah that Moabites and Ammonites are never allowed to come to the household of Israel. They are never to become a part of Israel. If that's what the commandment of God says, how did this woman, who was a Gentile, who was a Moabite, who God restricted their whole group to enter into the house of Israel, how does she become the grandmother of David HaMelech? What did she do? What was her actions? There's, there's only four chapters for those of you who missed the teaching on Shavuot, you missed it. I taught about Ruth. Now some of you may be, when did I teach? You didn't know I was teaching, no? That's the secret of the teaching. You didn't know I was teaching. So if you didn't know where I was teaching, then where were you? Are you walking with me? Or are you walking with Dr. Narendra Modi? The story of Ruth it's the story of someone from the nation who became grafted in. And because she became grafted in, because of her faithfulness, because of her desire, what was she telling Naomi? Don't tell me to go up, go back. Where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. This is what it means to be engrafted according to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 is not talking about another making something new. Romans chapter 11 is basically talking about what happened over here. We see another woman in the book of Joshua. Her name was Rahab, who decided, I also want to be with you. I heard about what your God did. And what did Joshua say? Okay, bring them and let them be part of the house of Israel. There is also another person called Jethro, Itro, who, is, who was a pagan priest, Moses' father-in-law. He heard the good deeds of God. A Gentile priest, he said, a pagan priest said, I want to join in. All throughout in the Torah, you have story after story, incident after incident of people from the nation who desire to seek after God who have become part of the house of Israel. It's no different for us. From the nations, do we desire God? Do we want to work with God? Do we want to be part of the household of God? It's not about going to Israel. Many of, many of us over here, we want to go to Israel and be buried in Israel. It doesn't matter where you are buried. If your heart has no connection with the true gospel of the gospel according to the Bible. That's the question. Shavuot celebrates the moment when 50 days after the exodus from Egypt, the Jewish people stood at Mount Sinai for the giving of the Torah. It celebrates the wheat harvest in Eretz Israel. The whole concept of Shavuot, I don't know, can, can, can we put our banner? Just put our banner on. I want us to look at that banner which we have this week. Look at this banner. Look at that mountain. I don't know if you can imagine what was happening in Exodus chapter 19. This picture is not able to really fully explain the fullness of what is happening. If you have a closer look, you can see over here there are Hebrew letters that are coming out. 
Literally, you know what happened? The people were surround, was surrounding the mountain. But from every side of the mountain, all of them, they saw the same thing. The sages say as if this mountain was on top of them. Asking, are you going to accept God? Are you going to walk with God? Are you going to listen to the word? Now just think, the mountain is on top of you. God's asking you the question. But you say, oh, but God threatened. Yes, sometimes God has to threaten us. Because we are used to living some lifestyle which has nothing to do with God. He has to threaten us to bring us to this place of accepting it. Because only when we accept it, then only the next step can be taken care of. The mountain is standing on top of them. That's that's what the Hebrew says. That's why it's very important to basically start learning the language. If you don't know the language, learn the language. Which reminds me, as Shavuot has just begun, God's put in my heart to begin a, a, a center where people would learn the Torah properly. Especially for young people. Now if you have a desire to learn God's word properly, it's time to come and talk to me. It's, kind of, it's very important because I'm not going to take 100 people. I'm only going to take a handful of people and we're going to focus on the next four years to, to disciple you, to train you, and to help you understand the scriptures properly. You might be reading so many things in English, but that's not what the English Hebrew says. What you read is translation. Have you heard of this expression in English? It's raining cats and dogs. Can those of you who are Telugu scholars please translate that to me? I'm, it's pouring cats and dogs. Please translate that for me. Chapandi. Huh? But not, I, I didn't say Varsham. It's pouring. Ah, what does that mean? Dogs and cats are falling? But that's not what the idiom basically means in English. Most of us are reading English Bible, Hindi Bible, Telugu Bible, whatever Bible you're reading. Remember, 80% translation gone. So what are you reading? What are you understanding? That's why we're going to start something for people only who want to learn. Those who don't want to learn, don't waste your time. Those who, those who basically want knowledge, go find somewhere else to get knowledge. We are looking for people who are willing to come along to help us establish the messianic movement in India. I want serious people. You might be working in a workplace or whatever it is, but you have a dream. You have a vision. You look at this nation of India and you're saying, oh God, we want to have authentic messianic Jewish centers all over. We have right now 29 states in the nation of India. Can we at least have one authentic messianic Jewish center? An authentic messianic Jewish center is a center that does not do nonsense that others do. It is a center that understands the word of God. It is a center that knows basically the written word of God and the oral interpretations of the word of God. It is a center that is focused to be part of the house of Israel in the right way. Now you want to do whatever you want to do, that's fine. You just do whatever you want to do. But that's not what we want to do and that's not the vision we have over here. We have a serious time frame, friends. If you want to walk along and desire to be part of the end time move, of what Shavul was talking about in Romans, in Galatians, in Ephesians, in the book of Revelations. If you want to be part of this end time move, it's, it's, it's a one time investment to cause your inheritance to be there for eternity. 
It's not about earthly inheritance. This is something that you will be remembered. You remember the Bible says, the, Bible, the Torah says, the Tanakh says in the book of Malachi that Hashem has a book of remembrance. Whose name is there in the book of remembrance? Men and women who have basically taken time to invest their life and their lifetime in service of God in everything that they do. Who made a difference, who caused an impact, who causing a rectification of the nations. You might not see the difference you are making in your lifetime. In the lifetime of our master Yeshua, he trained up 12. Out of the 12, one betrayed. He was replaced by another in the book of Acts after the season of Shavuot. What happened? These 12 changed the world. Do you want to be part of that small group of people? All throughout in the scriptures, God never used thousands and thousands of people. There was only one Abraham. There was only one Noah. There was only one Adab. There was only one Nehemiah. There, was, there, 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 there is only one Ezra. There was only one Shavuot. There is only one David Amalek. But they fulfilled their role or what they were called to do and they changed their destiny. They didn't even realize it. They were not doing it for changing anything. They just did living life to bring glory to God. That's all they did. And because of that, God used that faithfulness and, 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 and did a great impact. There was this Ruth. When she was doing what she was doing, she never thought that King David is going to come from her, her, her loins. She just made a commitment. Made a commitment to her husband who was Jewish. Made a commitment to her mother-in-law who was Jewish. And not like Orpha who turned her neck back and said, I'm just going to do, go back to my own religion, to my own family. But she said, no, I'm not, I don't have a family. I may have come from them, but now since I'm married to you, since even though my husband is dead, I'm going to follow you. Don't, don't, don't stop me. Don't, don't not allow me to come. I want to follow you. I want to die. Even if I'll die, I'll die over there. She never thought that Boaz is waiting for her. There was no intention of all that happening. She just wanted to serve God. By serving her mother-in-law. By being faithful to the house of Israel. By being faithful to the things of God. And God divinely intertwined, connected. And the Moabite women, who, Moabites who are not allowed to come into the house of God through Ruth. Now, Ruth has become the first Moabite who has joined in. And because of her faithfulness. What happened? What does the scripture says we read in the last part of uh, Ruth? Boaz gave birth to? Oved. Oved gave birth to? Isai gave birth to? Wow! And from the lineage of David the Melech comes Yeshua the Mashiach. In other words, because of one Gentile lady's devotion to God, her desire to change and walk in the ways of God caused the Messiah to come through her lineage, which she never even knew. Amazing, right? Shavuot basically means weeks. As it, it falls in seven weeks, a week of weeks. After Pesach, the culmination of the 49 pe Omer period, which began on the second night of Pesach. And because of this, Shavuot is also known in English as Pentecost, which basically means 50 in Greek. It is the 50th day after the completion of the counting of 49 days. The other names of Shavuot found in the Torah is, Shavuot is also known as Khag Ha Katsir. The festival of reaping. Remember the master said, the field is ripe, but the laborers are few. As I look around here in, in the two states of Telangana and Andhra, the field is ripe. And the amount of nonsense that has been taught in the name of 
people who are hungry is so abundant. But the laborers are less. Why? Because the laborers don't want to get trained. They don't, you, you can't have laborers who don't want to study. You can't have people to go out in the field who do not have the appropriate education. In a company, you need some education. Only if you have the proper education, you will get basically a good job. Until and unless if you're working with God, a miracle happens, you get a job, but now they're taking you because of your experience. The problem with the house of God or with, with the work over here in India, we have so many people who lack education. And why I don't want to study? Oh, I don't have money. I want free education. You know where we get free education? Government schools. What happened to children who are going through government schools? There's nothing wrong. But the problem is in most of our government schools or public schools, nothing is taught. The next generation is not taken care of. And because of that, many years ago in India, there was this movement among the graduates who basically would make sure that every poor child, every person who goes to government school would be taught privately. Why? If we need to have hope for this nation, if we want the leadership of this nation to change, it's time for us to bring the proper education to the people. The government does not want to educate us. For many people, even in the, in the spiritual world, in the religious world, in the Christian world, they don't want people to be educated because the minute you become educated, you begin to think. And when you begin to think, then you begin to question. When you begin to question, the leaders don't have an answer because they themselves are not educated. Why? I'm doing ministry. What ministry can you do if you're not educated? How are you being part of the house of Israel? Just because I wear this, I'm becoming house of Israel? Just because I put a talit on, I become house of Israel? Just because I have a Torah, I become part of Israel? Just because I have a hundred people and now I'm teaching God's word, I'm rabbi? No. We don't understand. This is the season of the reaping. But to reap the harvest, where are the laborers? Do you want to be a laborer? The scripture says, any man who puts his hand on the plow and looks back, what does it say? Is not fit. You decided to follow Yeshua, he's calling you to be a laborer. But many of us, we have put our hands at faith in the master, but we are looking back. You're not fit because your eyes are somewhere else. Why is my eyes somewhere else? Because I have this beautiful thing called gadget, which we call in our today's language smartphone. My eyes cannot be deviated from it. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. My mind is corrupted. Throughout the week, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, I'm seeing. And then I open the Bible and I'm reading. What is this? What is this? I don't understand. You have corrupted your own thoughts. Naturally, you're not going to understand. You look at yourself and ask yourself, in a week, how many hours do you watch? You don't know, you don't want to count? Most of your phones have screen time. Ask, ask your phone. The smartphone will tell the Dumbo how much is your screen time. So much of screen time, but I'm a believer. Believer of what? Facebook. Believer of what? WhatsApp. Believer of what? Twitter. Believer of what? My business. Believer of what? My company. Believer of what? Are you a believer of God's word? Let me ask each of you over here. Do you have even a Bible today in your hand? When was the last time you have even touched it? Felt the pages of it? Have you ever read at least once from page to page? 
How many books are there? Are you sure? It's not 60, no? It's not 100, no? Heavy read, page to page. The sad reality is we have not. The most many people have read is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No context. Some others specialize on the Pauline writings. No context. Here is a Jewish rabbi talking about some Jewish stuff and I'm trying to interpret it in my pagan mindset. I don't understand. Many of us have never even turned to the page called Isaiah. Never have seen that page called Jeremiah. Forget about Ezekiel. I don't even come close to it. Many of us have ever read Ruth or Esther because in our communities and certain seasons we get to read it. The first time we ever read Esther during Purim, people have told me, I've never read this book before. And that's the reality. I don't even know what is there. But I'm a believer. What believer are we? It's called Kaga Katsir. The next name for Shavuot is Yom HaBikurim, the day of the first fruits. Many people think after Pesach, the third day is known as Yom HaBikurim, but that's not correct. After Pesach, on the third day is not Yom HaBikurim, it's the bringing of the sheaves. It's not the Bikur over there. Yom HaBikurim is here during Shavuot. But this is what it says in English. No, no, stop looking at the English. Look at what the Hebrew says. Does the Hebrew say Bikurim? Then it's not Bikurim. Are you with me? Many of us, we want to focus on pronouncing the name of God. How do you know how to pronounce the name of God? Is it your second language or first language, Hebrew? What is it? Then how are you pronouncing? Have you studied Hebrew? Do you even know the vowel system, the Nikut system? In fact, in an original Torah scroll, a kosher Torah scroll, there is no vowels at all. So how are you reading what you're reading? Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahovah. I mean, that's fine if that's the way you want to call it. But how, how do you come to this conclusion? Based on the English? Then you got it wrong. The third is, the sages also call it Atzeret. Meaning, ref, ref, refa, refraining or holding back. So this, this basically connects Shavuot to Pesach. In a similar way that Shemini Atzeret is connected to Sukkot. We also refer to Shavuot in our prayers by calling it Zaman Matan Torah. The time of the giving of the Torah. You know, that's why Shavuot. How many of you know when Shavuot began? Huh? Huh? Thursday at sunset, Shavuot began. It was after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the master. More than 2,500 years ago, the master was on the earth. He rose from the grave on the third day of the counting of the Omer. And from the third day of the counting of the Omer, the Sefirat or Omer, Till the 40th day, the master was on the earth where he visited each of his disciples and people who are dear to him. And on the 40th day, the scripture says that in the midst of his disciples and followers, on from Mount Sion, he basically got resurrected. He got lifted up from the earth. And the angel said, what are you wasting your time watching here? Go and do the work. He who has gone up will come, get ready and prepare the field. But he said that before that happens, make sure that you first wait for the power of God 
on sh- uh, and go to Jerusalem because he left on day 40 and in 10 days time is day 50th. What is happening on day 50th? It is the festival of Shavuot. The Jewish people were the first Pentecostals. They waited on, on, on in Jerusalem. Why were they waiting? Was it because Yeshua told them to wait? No, because the Torah already told them three times a year you have to be in Jerusalem. So there they are on Pesach and now it is Shavuot. They are here in Jerusalem. In the, in, in the room over there in the temple courtyard. And it is that night of, 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 of that which we said on Thursday night. It was not Thursday night then but I'm just saying. It's, it was that night. That night was known as the night of power. Because that night it was not spent in sleeping. That night was not spent in eating cheesecakes. That night was not spent about just being joyful. That night was taking time to study the word. How many of us in our community this Thursday night thought of studying the word? You might be thinking, what is that to study? I can't even read one chapter without closing my eyes. Those of you who don't get to sleep, the minute I open the Bible, somehow the miracle of slumber begins to fall upon us. It's the same thing. I, have the, I also have that healing ministry here. The minute people begin to hear me, all of a sudden they begin to slumber. And they get this most powerful, intoxicating drink of sleep that they have never had. It's because there is a bondage, there is a, there is a principality that is not allowing you to listen to the word of God. Because if you listen to the word of God, you will be set free. But you have cost your minds. You have, you have basically downgraded your mind by listening and doing other activities. Where so when the spirit of God is doing something, you are not able to do. It was, it was on a night like Erev, Erev Shavuot that the disciples and 120 of them, they were all together throughout the night. They were studying, they were praying, they were in one accord. And then the scripture goes on to say what we read in Acts chapter 2. It seems that the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. This morning we read that scriptures. And these guys from Galilee... How are they speaking to us in languages from us who are coming from all over the world? Who are these people from coming from all over the world? These are basically Jewish people. There was no Gentile. There was no Goim. It was only Jewish people in the house of God. There were people from India. There were people from Pakistan. There were people from China. There were people from all over the world. They all were there in Jerusalem. Why? Because it's Shavuot. Here Yeshua and his disciples and 120 of them After an all night study of God's word Not all night watching of God's word Not all night eating and and putting on weight But it is an all night study for the soul Why am I studying? For the purpose of studying Nothing else I'm not studying to get brownie marks. I'm not studying to get some badge on on, on, on my Facebook as the anniversary follower. No, I'm studying because I want to study. I want to draw close to God. I want to have intimacy with God. And then the next morning, as they are having shakari, the morning prayer, it's 9 a.m. in the morning. And the scripture says in Acts chapter 2, the spirit of God fell like never before. And they began to speak in a language that others were able to understand. What were they saying? They were praising and glorifying God. And men and women from the nations who did not know Hebrew, they heard the language and they heard what they were saying. And they returned back to the Torah. And that's what true Shavuot is all about. But let's learn quickly What really happened? Acts chapter 2 is not something that happened first time. Acts chapter 2 is a repeat or a renewal event for the Jewish people. The first time it happened was with the children of Israel as soon as they came out of Egypt. The day that these events took place has a lot of different names which I basically shared before. You, some of us know this day as Pentecost, but that's not its name. In Hebrew, it's known as Shavuot. 
Now the word Shavuot, according to Leviticus chapter 23, it says Shavuot is a Moed. The Hebrew word Moed is mistranslated as festival or feast. The word Moed basically means an appointed time. Who has put this appointed time? God has put this appointed time. For whom? So that we would meet God and Allah invite him to come in our festival. Like I said, this is also known as Kaag Habikurib, which is based out of Numbers chapter 28. And then it, 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 for, for those of us from the nations, we not only have one day, but any festival is basically doubled. Like I said, it is, it is, it is customary during Erev Shavuot that we study Torah starting at sundown all throughout the night. So you might ask, if the real name of this festival is Shavuot, then why does the world call it Pentecost? You might be wondering, what is the connection between the word Pentecost, 50, Pente, oh, Pente, okay, Pentecost, 50 to Shavuot. Shavuot basically refers to the seven weeks that we count between Passover and Shavuot. Now many of us call ourselves Pentecostals, but you're not a Pentecostal just because you speak in other tongues. You should be a Pentecostal because you know the word of God. And the sad reality of these so-called many Pentecostals all over the world is we claim to be believers in the Messiah, but our character, our lifestyle, our worldview has nothing to do with our master. Why? Because we do not know end to end of what the scripture says. So Shavuot basically refers to seven weeks or 49 days that we count between Pesach and Shavuot. That period between Pesach and Shavuot is known as Sefirat HaOmer or counting of the Omer which we talked about. It is 49 days of basically refining our character, working on our internalities to prepare ourselves to receive God's word. On Nisan the 16th, an omer, which is a certain measure of barley sheaves, was brought as a wave offering to the temple. The wave, omer wave offering is brought on the 16th of Nisan, and this begins the counting of the omer. The next major harvest in Israel is basically the wheat harvest, which is the ripening during the counting of the omer. So once again, we count 49 days, which is basically seven weeks. Thus, Shavuot is called called weeks because Israel counts seven weeks or 49 days and on the 50th day Israel celebrates Shavuot. This is what the disciples of Yeshua were doing in Acts chapter 2 when they were all gathered together in the temple. Let's get a little bit of history for us to understand what was happening. The reason that the Jewish people read the, through the Torah on Shavuot is because it was on this day the Torah was given on Mount Sinai more than 3,500 years ago. It was called Matan Torah. Like I said, the giving of the Torah or the gift of the Torah. The Jewish people have been celebrating Pentecost or Shavuot for 1,500 years before the day when God's Spirit was poured out on Yeshua's disciples 50 days after Passover. But this is, it, it wasn't the first time that basically happened. On the first day of Shavuot, we, as we read this morning from Exodus chapter 19, and verse 20 and chapter 20, it includes what is referred by most Christians as 10 commandments. Like I said, the word 10 commandments is wrong. It is a wrong interpretation of the Hebrew because the Hebrew uses the word Aseret Hadebarot. Can we say it? Aseret Hadebarot which basically means 10 words or 10 utterances or 10 sayings. It's not the 10 commandments. It's 10 words, 10 utterances or 10 sayings or 10 statements. Aseret HaDebarot. After Hashem spoke the Aseret HaDebarot to the children of Israel, the scriptures say, the Torah says that the children of Israel were afraid. See what it says in Exodus chapter 20 verse 15 or 14. It says that when, can any of you read what is written in the Hebrew? No, I don't want Hebrew scholars to read. 
oh, oh, loud loud i want to hear it loud you, all of you some of you at least are learning hebrew now why am i telling you to read because those of you are not learning hebrew it's time for you to learn hebrew get a proper jewish education stop living with christian education and trying to interpret jewish scriptures get proper jewish education what does it say understand the scriptures how the jewish people see it by the way yeshua jesus whatever you call him he was jewish that's why so what does it say in hebrew the first word ha kolot and then the next word ha lapadim okay it says that when the people saw the english uses the word thunderings but the hebrew uses the word ha kolot and then lightnings the hebrew uses the word over here lapadim the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking the people were afraid and they tremble and what did they do they stood far off now there's so much i can talk about just this verse which will take me take us till 6 o'clock in the evening just in this verse but we don't have time so i'm just only going to focus on two words what is those two words those two words which we see in english thunderings and lightnings we are going to talk briefly about what the children of israel heard and saw on that first pentecost in exodus 19 and 20 the word in the english is the word thunderings but the hebrew word is kolot now remember kolot is basically the plural of the hebrew singular word kol kolot is plural which basically means voices and the word call basically means voice everybody with me so these are the three things that you need to know the word for thunderings in the hebrew is kolot the word call basically means voice and kolot in plural in, in kolot is in the plural and it basically means voices the thunderings they heard was was actually the voice of god but it says in the hebrew they didn't hear the voice of god in the hebrew it says they heard the voices of god they didn't hear one voice they heard voices of god not one voice now to confirm this concept of hearing the voice of god in fact if we go back to bereshit to genesis chapter 3 verse 8 just after adam and eve sin the scripture says in genesis 3:8 that they heard the call or the voice of the lord walking in the garden as the time of the evening breeze you see that hebrew word over there call that's the same word over here so this time in genesis it the word voice is in the singular it is the singular word call whereas in exodus which we read in exodus chapter 19 exodus chapter 20 it's the plural word of the same word voice kolot so the question we need to ask ourselves when was the last time have you heard a voice walking it says in genesis the voice was walking Have you ever heard the voice walking? What is it talking about? I'm, of course we can't hear a voice walking. We can't we, we can't hear the voice walking. We can simply hear the voice. The word for voice is in the text in Genesis is the Hebrew word kol which is a singular of the Hebrew word kolot. How does one see a voice or sound? One can maybe see a lightning but one cannot see a voice. right now just hold that thought and let's see what else happened on mount sinai the first thing was that they heard thunderings voices the next thing the scripture says is that in exodus 20 is that there was lightning the hebrew word for lightning over there is the hebrew word lapadim now the word lapadim is the plural of the hebrew word laped which basically means a flame or a torch so though lapadim can mean lightnings it more properly means flames or torches which is very very important to understand where did the flame or torches come from where did they get this idea from when recounting the story of on mount sinai uh like i said the third thing that we do in shavuot is what read through the book of deuteronomy how many of us have read it's a powerful book you need to just read and read it it's a powerful book I've, i that's what i did these last two days 
So when recounting the story of on Mount Sinai in Deuteronomy chapter 4, chapter 5, Moses repeatedly reminds the children of Israel that they heard the voice of God speaking from out of fire. In fact, the sages say in the Babylon and Talmud, which contain many of the discussions and interpretations of the Torah by some of the greatest sages, which some of the greatest interpretations, there is an interesting explanation of what it means to hear God's voice speaking from the midst of the fire. It says in the Babli Shabbat 88b, it says over there that the school of Rav Shamu Ishmael taught that with regard to this verse, which says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, that my word, behold, is my word not like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that shatters a rock. Just, go back. Just as this hammer breaks a stone into several fragments, so too, each and every utterance that emerged from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be He, divided into 70 languages or 70 tongues. Now the, the students of Rav Shamuel, what were they commenting on? They were basically commenting on that verse from Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 29. What does Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 29 say? It says, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. Have you ever used a hammer to break rocks into pieces? You've not. How technologically unsound you are. Take a hammer, find a big rock and start hitting it and see what happens. What happens? Oh, you guys don't know. Sparks begin to take place. That's what is happening. The word of God was coming like fire. In fact, Mount Sinai was not the first time God used heavenly torches of fire in making a covenant. What is happening on Mount Sinai is a covenant over here. You remember when Abraham was making a covenant with Hashem, God appeared to him in a fiery torch according to Genesis chapter 15, 17. So from this, 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 this interpretation of what the sages are saying, the understanding is that on Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, the voice of God split into 70 voices, 70 koloth, speaking of 70 different languages. You may be wondering, what is so special about the 70 languages? 70 languages is no coincidence because the scriptures, the Torah, identify the nations of the world as 70, which according to Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8, have been divided according to the number of the sons of Israel. If you remember when Jacob and Jacob had 70 descendants who basically went down to Egypt with him. Remember that's what it says in, in the book of Genesis, in the book of Exodus, 70 descendants. And it was from these 70 descendants, the world was divided into 70 nations. I know we have more than 70 nations today in the world, but it is all coming out from the original 70 nations which God made. Not only that, but the voices looked like flames of fire flying forth from the hammer's blows upon a fiery rock. So in other words, God's word, voice or God's word appeared to go like fiery torches that when they heard that word on Mount Sinai, this is what is happening. In fact, where did these, these the fire was going from God's mouth like a hammer that is hammering a rock. So the question we need to ask ourselves, where did these light, where did this fire, where did these torches go? In fact, this is what the sages say. It says, the word went forth from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be He. It traveled from His right side to the left side of the people of Israel and then proceeded to go around the Israelite camp. It would then proceed to go around from the right of the people of Israel. He would then ask each person, will you obey this word? 
and they would answer, we will do and we will hear. The Holy One would then receive this word, which is of the ten words, with his right hand and engrave it on the tablet. As the word of God was being engraved, God's voice would travel from one end of the world to the other in fulfillment of what is written in Psalms chapter 29, verse 7, which says that the voice of Hashem divides the flames of fire. Do you understand what he's saying? Let me help you understand this Midrash in simple language. In other words, this Midrash, this commentary, this, the sages are explaining that as the ten words were spoken out of God's voice, God's voice not only split into 70 flames of fire, but those flames traveled around to each member of Israel as a wave across the camp from the left side to the right side and the flame rested upon each of them and the voice asking them, will you obey the word? And what would they answer? They would answer in Hebrew, na ase venishma, which basically means we will do and we will understand. And then the voice of all Israel would leave the right side of the camp as one voice, returning to Hashem's right side. And he would inscribe that word on the stone tablets with the finger of God. Isn't that amazing? Now, if this is what happened, now, with this understanding, let's turn to the Brit Kadashah in the book of Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 2, beginning from verse 1, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and let us see what has happened. It says that the festival of Shavuot has arrived. What do people do on Shavuot? Where do they gather? In the temple. Where is the temple? In Jerusalem. Today there is no temple in Jerusalem. That is why we gather in our individual communities, not in our homes. Our home is an extension of the synagogue. The synagogue is the extension of the Beit HaMikdash. The earthly Beit HaMikdash is an extension of the heavenly Beit HaMikdash. Understand? That is why our home should be kept in a proper order. So then what does it say? They arrived there and the believers all gathered in one place. Why were they all in one place? Because that was the commandment. They had to be there, especially the men. When it is holidays, when it is Shabbat, important days, you don't continue working. Stop. Get, get your tukas out of your job. But if I don't complete my project, I will lose my job. Then you should lose your job. Because you are not honoring God. You are not keeping God important. And then what does it say? And suddenly... A roaring sound, it's the Hebrew word kol, it's the same word, voice, sound, kol, came from heaven like the sound of a windstorm and it filled the whole building where they were and there appeared to them tongues, remember? The tongues fell upon them on Mount Sinai. And here there are tongues that are separating, that is falling upon them. It is in the appearances of fire. In fact, Peter who wrote it basically, not Peter, Mark who wrote Acts basically, is basically saying the same thing what the Midrash is saying. Which basically tells me that Mark was somebody who knew the Jewish, Jewish writings and the oral writings. He is using Midrashic writings over here. And then what he says, it is they appear on them tongues separating in appearances of fire and each one resting on every one of them. And then what does it say? They were filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and they began to speak in other tongues as the Ruach gave them utterances. The word coal of the wind filled the courtyard. There was, there was this coal, there was this sound, there was this wind that filled the courtyard. But there was no wind. It filled the courtyard, but there was no wind. Notice what it says. It says over there, like the sound of a windstorm. Go back. Like the sound of a windstorm. It's the sound. There is no wind. It sounded like a windstorm. The Hebrew uses the same word for sound as voice. They were hearing what on Acts chapter 2? In the temple. What were they hearing? 
They were hearing the voices of Hashem. They saw the flame of fire. Lashanot. Separating. Tongues of fire. Separating. And resting on every one of them. Just like we read in the, in, in the Midrash of what the sage is saying. Lashanot. Tongues is the plural for Lashon. Tongue. Which refers to both the tongue of the mouth and also to other foreign languages. So in other words, the disciples were given the ability to speak, prophesy in the language of the Jews around them who had come to Jerusalem for Shavuot from the nations where they were living. These were the languages they did not know. These were Galileans. They did not know the languages of the Jews from those nations. But the Spirit of God gave them utterances. What was the purpose of these utterances? So that there would be repentance. So that there would be returning back to the Torah. True repentance is I am returning back to God's word. Repentance without returning to the Torah is not true repentance at all. That's why the scripture says after that, after all this incident, what happened? 3,000 of them. Who were the 3,000 of them? 3,000 were Jewish people. They were convicted. They were delivered. They repented. They returned back to the Torah. That's why if you go through all the book of Acts, you will see. Majority of the people who are coming, who are who? Are, who, are who? They were Kohenim. They were priests. They were, they were Levites. And along with them, there were people from the nations who also started be believing like Ruth the Moabite and they also desired to be joined into the house of Israel. So what do we understand from this? Acts chapter 2 is not something new. Acts chapter 2 is paralleling the giving of the Torah. There was fire on Mount Sinai. There was the spirit. We always, when we think about fire, we talk about the spirit. There was the spirit of God on Mount Sinai. There was the voices of God. It was the word of God. It's the same thing happening over here in Acts chapter 2. So Acts chapter 2 was a renewal event. A sign that the disciples of Yeshua of Nazareth were to bring the gospel of Yeshua of Nazareth to the nations. Which was basically affirmation of the giving of the Torah which happened 1,500 years before that. What were they to do? It was not just for them to speak in tongues and say, Oh, I'm holier than thou attitude. It was not for them to speak in tongues and wear white and white. No. It was for them so that they would begin to share the light of Mashiach, who is the living Torah to the nations. In fact, I like what it says during, during Sefirat or Omar. One of the things that we read or study or take time to work on our character is based out of Pirke Avod. It says in Pirke Avod chapter 6 verse 8. Rav uh, Yehoshua ben Levi, this is what he said. And the tablets were the work of God. Basically quoting Exodus chapter 32, 16. That the tablets were the work of God. And the writings were the writing of God graven upon the tablets and the sages go on to say the word for graven is the hebrew word karut they said read not karut graven but read it as kerut freedom what is freedom the torah god's word it's not graven it's not bondage it's not legalism it's freedom and then they go on to say for there is no free man but one that occupies himself with the study of the Torah. That means if you don't occupy yourself with the study of the Torah, you're in bondage. Even if you're in Messiah. I'm in Messiah, but you're in bondage because you don't occupy yourself with the study of the Torah. And by the way, study of the Torah is not done in my personal time. Yes, you should have personal time. But study of the Torah is done as a community, as a group. You need kavrut, you need friends to come together. That's why I was, I, was, I was asking some of our friends after the night, power of the night was over, I was asking. You knew it was Shavuot. You knew that it is a very special occasion. You as a man, what were you doing? 
Or I thought because you didn't say, we were not meeting. You're meeting for me? Hashem already told you what to do. Just because I didn't announce it, doesn't mean that you could say, Pastor, we need to study. I want to study. I don't want to sit at home and waste my time on Facebook and see what the world is doing. I want to study. So it says over here, the sages say, read not grave and karut, but read it as karut, freedom. For there is no free man, but one who occupies himself with the study of the Torah. And then it goes on to say, and whoever, can we say regularly? regularly. What is regularly in your definition? Every single day, whoever every single day occupies himself with the study of the Torah, what happens? I want to be great, I want to be popular, but I don't want to study God's word. Now don't study God's word to become popular, that's also the wrong intention. (laughs) Study the word of God because you want to study the word of God, God will exalt you. What did the master say? If you lift me up, I will draw all men unto you. That's the purpose. He is the living Torah. So when I study the Torah, when I study God's word, he is being lifted up. And when he is being lifted up, God is the one who is going to bring them. For what? Not to tell how great I am, but to tell how great it is so that I can begin to share the good news of Messiah, the Yeshua. That's what this, what is the season? This is the season, the festival of the harvest. The harvest is plenty. We are calling for laborers on Shavuot. In fact, Jacob, You know who Jacob is? There's a book called Jacob in your Bible. Do you know there's a book called Jacob in your Bible? Pastor, which Bible are you reading? Apocrypha? What what Bible? I have it in my Bible. You also have it in your Bible. Who is Jacob? It's James. So, but you will say, then why is he called James? You know why is he called James? Because the old King James. You know King James? There was the guy, King James, who basically helped to start the King James Bible, translate the Hebrew, the, the, the Greek into English. He wanted one book in the Bible for him. And that is why instead of putting the name Jacob, he put it as James. Understood? Artha Mainda? Good. So this is what Jacob, James, the brother of Yeshua, this is what he says. And what James says is exactly the interpretation of what we just read in Pirke Avot chapter 6 verse 2. What did he say? Here, James says, Yaakov says, He who looks into the perfect Torah of freedom. What is that? It says, Torah hakerut. And continues, not being a hearer. Who forgets, but one who does the word. This man will be blessed in what he does. It's good to study the word of God, but don't just be a hearer. What is a hearer? I am just studying. I have all the knowledge of the world. I can quote scripture inside and out, but I don't want to do anything. Who cares if you get first rank in quoting scriptures, but you're not doing even one percent. There are parents here. What are you going to teach your children what you don't have? Fathers, what are you planning to teach your children? Oh, I want them to have good education. For what? So that they will not struggle in their future. What about their soul? That they will pick up on their own. Who said so? They're not going to pick up from their own. They're going to do exactly like you. Can somebody give me my phone? Run, run. This is called running. Run, re. Some people, how much ever we say, they don't move. I'm sorry, I'm using this. I want you to listen to the words of a song called Cats in the Cradle. If you have it online, just put it on. It's called Cats in the Cradle. It says... My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk 
while I was away. He was talking before I knew it. And as he grew, he would say, I'm going to be just like my dad. You know, I'm going to be like you, dad. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When are you coming home, dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then and you'll know we will have a good time then. My son turned 10 just the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? And he said, uh, not today. I got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And, he's, and he walked away. But his smile never dimmed. And he said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, I'm going to be like him. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy, blue, and the man in the moon. When are you coming home, dad? I don't know when. But we'll get together then and you'll know we'll have a good time then. And he came from college just the other day. So much like a man, I had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and then said with a smile, what? I'd, I'd really like to, Dad. It's to borrow your car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? The cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy. Lit, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When are you coming home, son? I don't know when. Then we'll get together, Dad. And we'll know we'll have a good time then. Now, I'm retired. My son's moved away. I called him up the, just the other day. And I asked him, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. And the son said, I'd love to, dad, if I find the time. You see, my new jobs is very busy. And the kids have basically so a flu. But sure, it's nice talking to you, dad. It's, been sh it's sure nice talking to you. And then he hung up the phone and it occurred to me, he's grown up just like me. My boy was just like me and the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon little boy, blue boy and the man in the spoon. When are you coming home soon? When are you coming home, son? I don't know when, but we'll get together then, dad. We are going to have a good time. When the child was young, I'm busy. I'm busy. I have this work. I have that work. And after that work is over, now I have to watch movie because it's my precious personal time. I have worked so hard. So let me watch TV. It's my movie time. Then uh, after the movie time, now it's my Facebook time. After the, my Facebook time, then it is my alcohol time. After my alcohol time, it is my drinking time. Then it is my boost time. Then it is my pub time. Then it is my porn time. Then it is my this time. Then it is my that time. And then very soon, I have, son is asking, when are you going to have time? Very soon. And the son is saying, don't worry dad, I'm going to be just like you. Son grows up, becomes a teenage. And the dad is saying, I'm proud of you. Let's spend time together. Sorry dad, I just want your car keys. I just want all your things. I just want you because you're the perfect ATM machine. I just want that. I, I don't have time. So daddy gets retired one day. Daddy, daddy, when he was working, he thought he's going to work for the rest of his life. Little did he know that retirement is coming just around the age. And by the time he's retired, dad, daddy, daddy's little boy and daddy's little girl have already grown up and they've become adults. They are married. They're living far away. Dad, son, I would like to meet you. Dad, nice hearing from you. I would love to take time to spend time with you. What's this Jew job, you know? Is this this project I have, this project I have. Then I have to watch Facebook. Then I have to do this. Then my child has flu. Then I have this. Then I have this. And then it dawned on the daddy. He's become just like me. Many of us adults, you are doing what you're doing is because that's what you learned from your parents. You can either break the cycle, this shower oath, or you can continue the cycle of your heritage you have received from your planned parenthood. You can say, oh, poor me. 
Everybody should know. You don't understand. Oh, or you can say, Lord, I'm fed up of this poor me. I want to arise because I have the spirit of God within me. Oh, nobody is taking care of me. Nobody has to take care of you. Are you a child? Who needs a feeding bottle also? Diapers also? I'll keep it ready next week onwards. So we'll take you to the bathroom and change your dirty diapers. Shavuot is about being a laborer. Shavuot is about serving a chef. Shavuot is about passing on the gospel. Every year, we, we may seem to be celebrating the same festival in the same cycle. In reality, each time we complete the cycle, we ascend one step higher, one rung higher to Sinai, the fusion of heaven and earth to the revelation of the holy Mashiach. If Messiah has defeated death and if the spirit of Mashiach dwells within you, then we too can face our everyday challenges with faith, with emuna, because faith is able to transcend our limitations. I listen to a doctor's report. I go down the dumps. No! What does the scripture say? I was asking somebody this week, whose report are you going to believe? But the doctor said this, this guy said this, this guy said this. I said, I don't care even if Rajiv Gandhi comes from the grave and tells you this. What report are you going to believe? Put that report at the altar of God and say, God, you said, you're the one who came. You are the one who promised. I believe and I break every lie, every word, every confession, every contention that is made against me about my inheritance, about my progeny, about my future. I break it and I speak to my body. I speak to myself in Yeshua's name to be whole. Nothing is impossible. Stop making excuses. Stop being lazy. I get this, I get that. You don't get anything. You get it because you keep saying you get it. Why don't you change your vocabulary and say, I believe. I believe that in perfect faith in the coming of Messiah, that even though he delays, he will still come. I believe that because of him, I can live in perfect health. I believe because of him that I can overcome every storm. I believe that with perfect faith that he can do. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. You need to basically, some of you, you need to look at your feet, look at your body and tell your body it's time, enough. Stop the nonsense. I have Messiah in me. I have Christ in me. We can do all these things, friends, through Mashiach. Nothing is impossible. No goal is unachievable. No sin invincible. Oh, I'm always falling down. I'm always, stop falling down. Nobody's making you fall. You're falling down by yourself. Oh, I'm watching porn. I'm always drinking. Stop it. Some of you need to leave your current situation and go to some other place so that you can get delivered. Some of you need to fast for extended amounts of time to get that spirit of sin out of your system. Don't go. Don't eat. Nothing's going to happen. Fast. Fast until that demon of death that you have spoken into your life is gone. And let faith arise. All things are made possible with Hashem. We can do all things through Messiah who gives us strength and truly achieve the purpose or our goal in our lives. And what is the goal? The final goal. What is our final destination? To meet Him face to face and to reflect His glory 
upon my life. We can strip away the layers and break the chains that hold us back. You have the power, friends. You have the power. The question is, do you want to respond to the power of resurrection? Do you want to respond to the fire of God this morning? That's the mystery of Shavuot. The mystery of Shavuot is, I'm going to take it. I believe that same power that the disciples of Yeshua of Nazareth received in the upper room, in Acts chapter 2, in the Jerusalem, in the temple, I want it. For what? So that I can be a living testimony. So that His name would be glorified and His name would be worshipped. Amen.